This is Tonight in Bright Sunshine. I'm Bruce Whitfield. Welcome to another edition going out into the sticks, if you like, or maybe it's into the most beautiful harbour in the world. We're at the VNA waterfront, and with me is the chief executive of this waterfront. His name is David Green. Welcome to Tonight with Bruce Whitfield in the middle of the day as we are here. You're chief executive of this great big uh, estate, all owned by Growth Point and the Public Investment Corporation. That's correct. No, it's, it's a wonderful pleasure. I used to come here as a tourist and pay to come here, and now they pay me to manage it. Well, that's really good news. Um, it was quite controversial when Growth Point brought this property um, way back in 2011, paid 9.7 billion rand after Transnet had sold it just two years before for about 75% of that to foreign investors. Um, but the investment hasn't stopped, which is what is so interesting. You're tearing bits of it to pieces, you're investing new money in. It, there is a big drive going on here. There is a big drive going on. I think the, the new shareholders have, they're, they're long-term investors. Um, it's absolutely right that um, the growth point and the PIC should uh, be the owners of this asset. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a national treasure. Uh, it's an international treasure. And I think the difference with the new shareholding is that they are long-term investors and they've got capital to invest. And we've got an incredible capital program coming up. What, make, what makes developments like this work? Because you can hear the industrial clang in the background. You can hear the Port Authority in the background calling for the fact that a bridge is about to lift up because a boat is about to pull through behind you over there. I mean, this is a living, thriving, working environment, yet it is the centre of Cape Town's entertainment, uh, entertainment industry as well. Hmm. I think the difference here is that this is a small neighbourhood within Cape Town and when it was first set up just over 20 years ago, people had absolutely the right idea. They wanted authenticity. So the difference between owning and managing a building and owning and managing a precinct is massive. And, and the most important thing, the thing that adds real value, is the, um, is the activities and the interest and the different things you do with the spaces between the building as much as it is actually managing the building. And it was when Growth Point bought it, the yields weren't fantastic. It didn't look like it was going to be a great investment. Are you getting those yields up a little bit? So are you being the bad landlord and charging the rentals? I think um, this um, property has gone through quite an interesting transition. It was um, Transnet state-owned. It went, it was privatised. Now, there was a lot of negative things happened during that privatisation. There's also some positive things in terms of business focus, a shift from public to private. And, and part of what is happening is, is that um, kind of drive for efficiencies. Um, it's not so much being the bad landlord, it's actually being the good landlord and actually providing the platform for people to thrive. And, and when people thrive, then you get higher retail sales and then uh, rentals are more affordable. Uh, I saw some South African tourism stats from a couple of years ago that suggested more than 20 million people come through here on an annual basis. I'm assuming that year on year, you're seeing some fairly decent growth considering the RAND is weakened. I see lots of foreigners about. Um, what sort of sort of growth are you seeing at the moment? Yeah, no, we, we're, we're seeing very, very strong growth. In the last two years, our retail sales, we've seen them growing about an average of 20% per annum. Now that is turbocharged by the tourist tourism, but you have to remember 55% of the people who come to the waterfront are Cape Tonians. Another 19% are um, other Africans, and it's only 26% are international tourists. But having said that, I think even we have been surprised with the weakness of the RAND, just how quickly people these days respond to the tourists come in and appreciate value. Which means you can't stand still. Um, and just behind you is a very innocuous looking yellowy block, um, which is one end of a whole series of grain silos. Um, and you're involved with the man who runs Puma, Jochen Zeitz, um, in taking what are, you can't get any more industrial than that, mm. and turning it into what hopefully will become quite possibly one of the most beautiful gallery spaces in the world. That's right, this is probably our most exciting project. We wrestled with these buildings, they are, um, they're a historic landmark, they were the tallest man-made building in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they went into disuse about 20 years ago. There were plans to try and take them out and develop around them. But I think when we came here about five years ago, the thinking was that this is fantastic industrial architecture. So we wanted a way in which we could celebrate that, have the public people appreciate and understand that. Um, and we were searching around for a use and we came up with this use the, of, of a museum. So we researched the world as to how do these museums work, looked at the different factors that, that were required. First of all, you need capital. Normally the capital is provided by the government or a lottery fund. But it, you know, this is a South African reality that the funds cannot be dedicated towards a museum, towards culture in, in that quantity. So we needed a, a funder and that's where the shareholders, PIC and Growth Point, stepped up and, and understood 
that the waterfront needs draw cards and attractions like this, and they saw the sort of longer term vision in it. Secondly, you need a collection, um, you need a curator, and these things just, we had this confluence of factors coming together. We came across Jochen Zeitz, and Mark could see as the curator. Jochen, um, very successful businessman, real passion for Africa, and had built up one of the top three collections in the world. Of African art. Of contemporary African art. And that's, that's a very good point, which, what, what I love about this is it's repurposing an old building. It's not a, a sort of monument to the architect, it's repurposing an old building, celebrating the architecture, and a showcase or a platform for contemporary African art, uh, which is quite unique because if you look around the world just now, developers are injecting culture, but it's not their culture. So they might go to the Pompidou Center and they'll inject the Pompidou Center into the Mideast. They'll bring um, masters from Holland and from, uh, from France and inject that into their development. What I love about this is that it's, it's African art. So it's, it's an opportunity. This African art, is in high demand, it's sitting in bank vaults in Switzerland and, and the US, and it's just an opportunity for us to showcase the best of Africa. You're not going to do what the Asians are doing, and sort of taking the Tate brand and rent, uh, borrowing the Tate brand and sticking it on as Tate Shanghai. You're going to have Tate Africa or Tate Cape Town. Will you be doing that? Will you be taking one of the, the great global brands of, of galleries? No, no. What we will be doing, though, is that we'll create something of a scale that will allow us to be the host to these kind of traveling ah. exhibitions. So the, the model of Tate and Pompidou now is that they have massive collections collections and they, and they tour the world. So this will for the first time give us a, a facility which is safe, secure and, and of the scale which can host these, these travelling facilities. And equally reciprocally we can lend out um, the best of contemporary African art. And, and so you will become part of this global network then where we could get a Matisse exhibition, we could get a Degas exhibition, a Picasso exhibition. And because the walls are going to be about that thick, because that's how thick grain silo walls are, the owners of the collections will feel perfectly secure. This is a big project though. This is a 500 million rand project. That's you know, a, a big chunk of what was invested here initially. I mean, this is quite serious. What is the, the draw card then? What is the value of having this art collection? Because art is you know, for the hoi polloi, isn't it? I think the importance is, is the importance of culture um, to society and I think you have to believe that contemporary African art tells contemporary African stories. You have to believe that people are enriched by hearing these stories and interpreting the art. We've got a very strong drive to make sure it's accessible to everybody. It will not be rich for the rich and high people, it will have accessibility. We're also going to drive a very strong schools programme. We've got a great model here in the aquarium who drive through some 54,000 school children. So a great educational program in there. Okay, so it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful environment. The environment is growing. You're kind of restricted, though, by sea on one side and a great big city on the other. Is there an expansion opportunity for, for, the, for the waterfront? Are you looking at acquiring land, or have you got enough real estate here that you can go up with? Yeah, we, we, have, um, we have a lot of real estate. We have additional planning consents. Um, and there's three areas that we're currently developing. And one is the silo area, the next is the gateway area on the entrance, and then finally Granger Bay on the other side in front of the stadium. So we have got a lot of potential to grow there. Um, we are looking um, that there will be various privatizations of land come up, notably the Somerset Hospital. We'll be looking to participate in that. Um, the port is also looking at moving its activities southward, so we'll be looking to participate in that. So there's a natural extension of all the good things about the waterfront, this mixed-use, multi-use, accessible to everybody, um, beautifully presentable area that, that we, can, we can expand into. I mean, anybody who spends a little bit of time in Cape Town and watches the cruise ships come and go is cognizant of the fact that there isn't a cruise ship terminal in, in Cape Town. Uh, Fifty years ago, when cruise ships were the, the prime mode of transport, they used to come here lots. So they're now coming back again, mm. and there is no terminal for uh, for people with uh, with Louis Vuitton handbags to come off um, and not scuff their uh, scuff their Jimmy Choo's when they when they come off the the cruise ships. Are you looking at that? Yeah, we, we we do receive about 20 cruise liners here in the waterfront, and there's probably, you know, there must be of the top five destinations to sail into to sail into Cape Town Harbour with the mount of the backdrop. We've got a berth, and we receive about 20 to 25 ships here. They're the smaller vessels. We're in conversations with the port to have a tender um, to uh, manage a cruise terminal berth in E-Berth, which is actually adjacent to our existing land. So we're hoping to hear on that, whether we're successful in, the, in getting the management of that in the next few months. Yeah, and what is happening with those, with those cruise ships? Well, I would assume if you provide the facility, more of them will come. It's not, the cruise industry has its own kind of economics and, and dynamics, and it's not a case of build and they'll come. 
but it is a case of saying we want people who come here to have the best possible experience which will want them to repeat that, that experience. So it, it is, um, it's about being in the market, about providing the right facilities, the whole range of things that the cruise operators want to and, and, and part of that is a, is a building. Um, unfortunately weather seasonality means there's only a limited window so you can't run it like you can run Miami. But I think we're very interested in making sure that people get the best possible experience when they come what to What sort of volumes do you need to make it work? Considering if you're only getting 25 a year, that's one every two weeks, it, it, you, you really need to be doubling or tripling that. You need, you need even more than that. I mean, I think that the metric is around 200 cruise days per annum. Now, that's just physically not possible. But having said that, what that means is that we will need to be creative and we'll need to create a multi-purpose facility. And that's where the waterfront can work because we've got multiple uses. Uh, we can provide that, that sort of different varied uses for the cruise terminal. So it is not purely a dedicated one, it may have conferencing facilities, it may have function facilities, but it's, it's, it's just being a bit creative to be able to um, have the right offering when the cruise liners come in. When we look at this as a hub for visitors, um, local and international visitors, African visitors coming to, uh, coming to the Western Cape, they come to the waterfront, they have an experience here. What vision do you have, the overall overarching vision? We've seen waterfronts all over the world. Some have bombed, Baltimore's is horrible, for example, and um, others have succeeded. What's going to make this one of the top three in the world, if it's not already? Look, our vision is to be the best waterfront in the world. We have all the ingredients to be that. We've got a, we've got a private single land holding, um, we've got capital, and we've got an appreciation that what is important is the authenticity, um, it's the spaces, the activation, and, and first and foremost, it's actually primarily engaging with the local population because it's about being a success with Cape Towns. The original vision for the waterfront was to connect Cape Town with the water, and we have to keep that vision going because that's what authenticates the destination for tourists. Tourists want an authentic experience. They don't want uh, a tourist trap. They actually want, and what we are able to provide is a safe platform for them to engage in a meaningful way with Cape Townians and all the different ideas and creativity in Cape Town. And that's what we're aiming to do. Now, before the seagulls drop something horrible on us, I'm gonna say thank you, David Green, very much for your time this afternoon. Chief Executive here at the VNA Waterfront in Cape Town, one of the most beautiful places in the world. This has been tonight. Thank you for watching. Back in studio very soon without squinting. Good night.